Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning. Let us open with prayer. God of our weary years, God of our silent and loud tears, God who has brought us this far along our way, God who has moved in the past through our ancestors, moves with us here in this space, and will continue to move. God, help us be attuned to that movement. Help us be attuned to the movement of your spirit in this worship service. Help us to be attuned to the movement of your spirit through song and prayer and the preached word so that we may continue to move in you, through you, and with you as we leave this place. Amen. May we prepare to worship in song. We are grateful and we appreciate Jackson State University and their Joella Gibson Ensemble.
magnify the Lord with me. God is good. And yes, and I am so proud and humbled to have the opportunity to welcome you all to this, our fourth week of our fourth annual Black History and African American Heritage Month worship series here at Phillips Theological Seminary. I am Arthur Carter, Director of Black Church Traditions, also Assistant Professor of New Testament. And on behalf of our President, Nancy Pittman, our Interim Dean, Lisa Davidson, we welcome you to this service. And our Board of Trustees, so I would also like to welcome our Board of Trustees who is in town. And as we close this Black History and African American Heritage Month se uh, worship series, I just wanted to take a time to look back and to think forwards, which is a part of the African, Pan-African mindset. And so we here at Phillips have a proud, progressive theological heritage. It was before Brown versus the Board of Education that the Board of Trustees of Phillips University decided to integrate, yet they were constrained by state laws and state lawmakers. But once Brown versus the Board became precedent, Phillips integrated. And circa 1950s, we can look at Phillips Bible College faculty. And oh, God works. And oh, we know how God can change. But it was people within institutions that allowed that to happen. Because we are the offshoot, the byproduct of Phillips Theological Seminary and Phillips University. And our faculty now is so much different. Still stellar, progressive theological education. And so when we're thinking about Black History Month and African American heritage, we need to not just look back over there, but sometimes we have to look back in our own backyard. And so I would just like to remember some people. Two of the first individuals that, that integrated, that desegregated Phillips University were Philip Porter and Lois Mothershed. Philip Porter from Enid was active in the desegregation movement in Enid and was a disciple. Lois Mothershed from Little Rock, Arkansas is the sister of Mothershed that was a Little Rock Nine. She was the older sister and it was just years it was when Lois Mothershed desegregated Phillips that we understand that then her sister became the Little Rock Nine and desegregated Little Rock. Phillips is a part of this story. And Walter York, one of the first um, African-American chaplains, was one of the first, if not the first, graduate of the theological seminary. And so as we move forward with this worship series, it is in our interest, it is in our debt, it is in our duty to thank God for trailblazers, to thank God for those that sacrificed, to thank God for individuals that decided to make hard decisions. And each of these individuals became active in the church, active in the world, and active change agents. And this is who and where we are. And we don't have to just look way back. Because when we moved from Enid to Tulsa, we continue to have individuals that are waymakers. And so we also remember our brother John Carter Thomas, our brother Ray Owens, our sister Annie Lockhart Gilroy. They've made changes. And we worship God for them and we praise God for the duty to move forwards. Welcome. May we worship. Yeah. 
Lift Every Voice and Sing. By James Weldon Johnson. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing, sing a, a song, song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing, sing a song, song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed? We have come over a way that tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the bright gleam of our bright star is cast. The God of our weary years. God of our silent tears. Thou who has brought us thus far on the way. Thou who hast by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee. Lest our hearts Drunk with the wine, lift every world, voice and we sing. Forget thee, my James shadow Rose beneath Rose. thy hand. May we forever stand. Lift every true to our, our God, God, true, true to our, our native, native and land. Heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty, and let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Amen. Friends, we are a blessed people today. Perhaps you're blessed every day, but today I'm telling you that you are a blessed people today. There is a preacher in the house. I am blessed and honored and excited to introduce my friend, my sister, my big sister, my co-conspirator in this academia and ministry life, the Reverend Dr. Courtney Alma Bryant. Through her ministries of healing and education, Reverend Dr. Courtney Alma Bryant seeks to empower individuals and communities to collaborate with God in the cultivation of just and whole communities. Guided by her firm belief that we were created for freedom and relationship with God and one another, she focuses on ministry that makes the mantra a reality for those that she touches. Her scholarship, academic, and ecclesial teaching as well as her preaching, focuses on raising consciousness of the power that resides in our flesh, the divine activity of God in a fallen world, and how humanity can collaborate with God through love in manifesting transformation, liberation, and justice in the world. So just light work. <laughs> Dr. Bryant received her MDiv from Duke Divinity School and her PhD from Vanderbilt University with a few of us in this space. Vanderbilt rose deep. Bryant currently teaches womanist ethics at Manhattan College and serves as the pastor of righteous relations at All Angels Church, both in, in North, both in New York City. In addition, Bryant helps churches and organizations manage change and conflict and develop strategies for transformative encounter, impact, and engagement. Bryant's first book, which my class is reading this week, so this is the author, y'all. Brian's first book, Erotic Defiance, Womanism, Freedom, and Resistance, published by Fortress Press, offers a theological account of the power of the flesh and its role in moral agency. And while all this is good and great, I'm blessed that Courtney is someone who can get a prayer through and a friend who will journey across time and space with you. 
Dr. Bryant, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. Your home here. Preach it all and welcome. <laughs> church growing up, there was a verse that said, God is my rock, rock of salvation, a strong deliverer. In him I will always trust. And for that reason, I can't stop praising my God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for setting that atmosphere, Reverend Ivy. Thank you as well for that beautiful welcome, Dr. Carter. And thank you to my sister, Dr. Yarborough. It is so wonderful to be with you today. It feels very familiar, very much like home. And that is all you can ask. I want to spend some time today in the Word. First with Mark 9, verses 2 through 9 and then 2 Corinthians. And we're going to be talking a little bit about discipleship, about holiness. And the word reads thus in Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, and led them up a mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. 
His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, saying, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly they looked around, and they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And then we're going to take a short walk to 2 Corinthians verses 4, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And it reads, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see this light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. I invite you to pray with me. Holy Creator, you who sustains each and every one of us. I ask that your spirit would be upon me so that preaching would be easy and so that the hearts of this waiting congregation might be pricked to transformation and elevation in relationship with you. I ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. This morning's Mark and 2 Corinthians texts point our attention to the hidden nature of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4 says, the God of this world, make no mistake, that's not God, God, right? Has blinded the minds of unbelievers. In other words, the truth of the gospel has been hidden from them, such that they are spiritually blind and literally unable to see the glory of God in Christ. In contrast, Mark 9 presents an unveiling of the identity of Jesus atop what scholars believe to be Mount Tabor. And this unveiling is so exclusive that not even all of the disciples get to come. Instead, Jesus brings a select few. Peter, James, and John, his inner intimate circle. And at the top of the mountain, Jesus' appearance is dramatically transformed such that his clothes become a dazzling white light, the brightest of lights one could imagine. This light energy was what we call a theophany, a manifestation of the real presence of God in material reality. A behind the scenes look at the true nature of Jesus Christ, reserved for his most intimate friends. If this were not enough, Moses and Elijah, iconic figures from the Hebrew scriptures, also appeared and began to have a chat with Jesus. 
I can imagine the fear and awe of the disciples as they witnessed sights beyond their wildest imaginations. Not only were, was there this miraculous presence of divine light emanating from Jesus, but Jewish heroes, Moses, the deliverer, and Elijah, the prophet who had never tasted death, but was taken up into heaven, now sat before them, chatting with Jesus as if it was nothing. Can you imagine? Had you been there, would, there have, would you have needed any further proof that Jesus was indeed the Son of God? This miraculous disclosing of Jesus' divine energy is the stuff that faith is made out of. Reminding us of how much of a blessing it is to be privy to the reality of who Jesus Christ is. However, the story of the transfiguration also reminds us that everybody does not get the privilege of mountaintop experiences of revelation and how much of a need there is for the truth of Jesus Christ to be revealed to those who are blind. Still, I want to turn your attention to the actions of Peter. And the mistake many Christians can make as insiders of the revelation. And I got to tell you, I love Peter. I love Peter because Peter is always getting it wrong, <laughs> right? All this zeal, all this love for God, right? But always gets it wrong. You see, in the midst of his amazement at the sight of Jesus in conversation with Elijah and Moses, Peter suggests that it is good for the disciples to be there so that they can build three dwellings, three tabernacles, essentially sacred tents for each of them, right? And it sounds like a good idea, but immediately God interrupts them, right? And veers the attention back away from Peter to Jesus. You see, Peter's idea veers dramatically away <laughs> from God's intention for this moment. After he says, let's build these tabernacle, God interrupts Peter and refocuses the attention on Jesus, who God calls his beloved son, and tells the disciples, listen to him. This refocusing, I contend, is God's way of shifting the attention away from the silly thoughts of Peter. Back to the matter at hand. You see, Peter makes the mistake that many of us as believers, and most certainly seminarians, right? Right? He makes this mistake, and that is that we get caught up in the privilege of being privy to the revelation. We get so caught up in being in the privilege of being privy to the revelation such that we want to set up shop at the sites of revelation. We want to revel in the goodness and the glory of God's presence, and that sounds right. It sounds right. Don't get me wrong, I know it feels good to be here. It's empowering to have this insider knowledge. <laughs> It's a boost to our self-esteem and our sense of certainty. It makes us part of the spiritual elite, the wise ones, the bearers of knowledge. But often, this knowledge, when we stay at these sites of revelation, are for our edification alone. You see, when we set up camp, at the sites of revelation, we center our own needs above the needs of God and above the needs of a world that is in desperate need of the truth of Jesus Christ. What I want us to see here is that this kind of spirituality does not require much of us, except that we be onlookers. It allows us to entrench ourselves in the celestial, sacred, and miraculous. But it does not require us to put any skin 
in the game. When we, like Peter, erect our sacred tents, we separate ourselves from the world so that the, relation, so that the revelation becomes about us and our power alone. But as 2 Corinthians 4 attests, the revelation of the glory of Jesus Christ must be shared. Your enrichment is not the end goal alone. It is not just about our power, but when we attempt to remain on the mountaintop, at the site of revelation, we center our needs, our comfort, our spiritual sustenance at the expense of a world that is groping around in the dark in need of illumination. But in order to allow our light to shine among humanity, we must come down from the mountain. For as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, we do not proclaim ourselves. It's not about us. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. And get ready because here's the hard part. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord by declaring ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. Many of us want a life want the life of a Christian to be the life of spiritual status in which we proclaim truths and revelations from the comfort of our certainty and being right. In fact, a lot of us found our way to seminary because of an addiction to being right. However, the mandate is clear. We are to be more focused on proclaiming Jesus than our superiority. And here's the part that I don't want you to miss. This proclamation of the revelation of Jesus is not about words. It's not about having the right story or the right interpretation of scripture or doctrine. It is about actions. It is not about what you have seen or what you think you know, but about how your life demonstrates God's power and glory. You see, there is a big difference between proclamation and demonstration. Demonstration, is not, doesn't, demonstration requires the involvement of your body. Demonstration requires your life, or better yet, the loss of it. We demonstrate the glory of God in our lives by proclaiming ourselves slaves to Christ, by coming down from the mountain of insider knowledge and sharing the, the glory of Jesus Christ through obedient surrender to God. Now, I have to admit, as a black woman, the analogy of slavery is a hard one, especially in the middle of Black History Month. So I think it important to spend some time here lest God somehow become a slaveholder. You see, there's a dramatic difference between the bondage that we as Christians surrender ourselves to willingly and the slavery imposed upon Africans brought to this country under the threat of violence and even death. For Paul, this bondage is a state of being that yokes or connects us to God such that our lives become God's. Such that, as Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is Christ. Declaring ourselves slaves to Christ means doing the bidding of Christ and not the amplification of ourselves. This might mean a loss of status and even a loss of power as the world understands it. But it is in the sacrificing of our own lives for God that the power and glory of Christ is proclaimed. It is our participation in loss, in a practice that does not contribute to worldly gain and in some cases results in personal sacrifice that causes the world 
to take notice. Aren't you tired of hearing people yap about what they think they know? Aren't you tired of people proclaiming truths from the comfort of their sacred platforms with no transformative witness to show for it? I have a suspicion Jesus was well aware that in this age, the power of words would become diluted. I believe this was in part why he instructed Peter, James, and John not to tell anyone what they had witnessed until he had completed his ministry here on earth and rose from the dead. I believe that Jesus knew that showing was more important than telling. Too many of us are passionate about telling the world what we know, but far too few of us hold that same passion for showing the world how our lives have been transformed by our encounter with Jesus Christ. The importance of coming down from the mountain and showing rather than telling can be seen in the life of Ella Baker, an important figure in black history. Ella Baker was a deeply spiritual woman. She was a Christian, but not the kind of Christian that ran around evangelizing with her mouth. Instead, she was humble. She was a woman dedicated to the work of pursuing the freedom that God desires for all human beings. One of my personal heroes, Baker rarely quoted the Bible and made few religious statements. Instead, her life was a religious statement. Godmother of the civil rights movement, Baker was one of the principal architects of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She did invaluable legwork for the NAACP, helping to determine the evolution of the civil rights movement. She cared about those in need of dignity. She saw religion as a, a deep sense of community and was committed to the full belonging of all of God's children. She championed efforts for cooperative economics so that all might have the resources they needed. And all of this was done as an outgrowth of her discipleship. I can hear the rumblings, though, in some of you already. Oh, she didn't tell enough people about Jesus. Oh, she didn't quote scripture. Oh, she didn't make it clear who she was coming in the name of. For those who are thinking that, I want to challenge you to look at the ways that Jesus operated, the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples of show rather than tell. Ella Baker didn't make money from the service she contributed to the movement, and in many ways she was actually disrespected because of her commitment to egalitarianism, mutuality, and the dignity of all, rather than just some. And still, she persisted. Because the truth of the gospel, that we are all worthy of God's love, and that God created us for freedom, was more than just a theory or a doctrine for her, but the very practice of her life. Did you hear that? A practice of life. Discipleship is not a state of mind. It is a practice of life. It is the congruence of the proclamation of Christ and a life lived for Christ. It is less words and more embodied acts of love. The pursuit of justice, the preservation of human dignity divinely imparted into the lives of the priest, the politician, and the pauper. But this cannot happen on the mountaintop. It cannot happen when we cloister ourselves from the reality of the world for the sake of feeling holy. 
we seek that holiness and we recognize that holiness means to be set apart, but we forget the latter portion of the definition. Okay. Holiness is to be set apart, but the latter part of the definition is for God's exclusive use. You are not set apart to be superior. You are not set apart to be knowledgeable. You are not set apart to tell those people something about themselves. You are set apart for God's exclusive use. Baker's life reminds me of a poem rumored to be recited by Pope Francis. Now, while Pope Francis actually never recited the poem, its contents still ring true, and so I want to leave you with these words. He says, we, he didn't say, <laughs> we need saints without cassocks. We need saints without veils. We need saints with jeans and tennis shoes. We need saints that go to the movies, that listen to music, that hang out with friends. We need saints that place God in first place ahead of succeeding in any career. We need saints that look for time to pray every day and who know how to be in love with good things. We need saints for the 21st century with a spirituality appropriate for this new time. I truly believe that what this poem is getting at is the fact that we need saints to come down from the mountain of self-aggrandizement of superiority, of arrogance, and to feed the world the spiritual food of God's love, God's enduring love that set us apart for God's sacred and special use. Will you answer that call? Will you come down? from the mountain. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God, give us what we need to come down from the mountain. As holders of this revelation, help us to center and hear the desire of you and your people. God, help us to receive the overflow of your revelation, not to hold it for ourselves or for the edification of our tents, but with the blessing of overflow, help us to be socially conscious and communally connected to put the overflow in a cup that the people recognize. May we surrender ourselves willingly to the burden of revelation and the work of being living proclamations of God's enduring love. Ashe. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the ways that you showed up. We thank you for the ways that your spirit resides within us, oh God, so that we might be a living sanctuary for you, oh God. Lord, as we continue on in this week, I ask that you would strengthen and empower and give courage and boldness to all of those under the sound of my voice to be that living sanctuary 
to be that place of comfort, that place of enlightenment, oh God, that place of love and care for those who are groping around in the dark in this world. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I pray that you guys go out into the world and cause a ruckus because you have visited a site of revelation this day and you have become clearer about what God has called you to be in this world. In the name of Jesus, go and be great. Amen. Well, I know. They might not know it, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs>